Good evening to all the attendees here, students, parents, high school counselors. Thank you for joining us. Uh, please uh, come forward to say thank you to Ms. Emily Smith uh, from the universe, from Western New England University. Uh, it's very early in the morning out there, so thank you so much, Ms. Emily, for joining us uh, uh, this evening and, of course, this morning uh, out there in the U.S. Uh, as many of you have seen in our marketing email that went out to your schools and guidance counselors. The topic for the day today is choosing the best U.S. university for you. And uh, the first 30 minutes, Ms. Emily is going to be speaking about this session topic. And the next 30 minutes, she's going to be um, speaking about her institution, Western New England University. And of course, uh, the last, uh, once she's done with her presentation, we'll be keeping time for a Q&A session. So please don't worry about that. We, are, we would love to answer your queries. And uh, what we will be having is also a couple of polls during the session to keep you engaged. And uh, without further ado, I think I'm going to hand over the stage and the microphone to Ms. Emily Smith. Thank you once again for joining us and all the best. Thank you once again. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am so excited to be here. Unfortunately, I wish I could be doing this um, presentation in front of you in person, but we are making the best of it and we are lucky that technology allows for that. So um, again, my name is Emily Smith. I am an international admissions counselor from Western New England University. And uh, today I will be talking about how to choose the best U.S. university for you. Um, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about because there is so much to consider and there, it's a very exciting time for students when you're looking at what you're really interested in. And um, there's a lot of different factors, not only just academics, but we'll get more into that. So the first things um, that you consider when you're going into any U.S. institution, you are going going to want to look at the location, um, the type of university that it is, uh, the size of the university, what academic programs that they're offering, um, outcomes, and then cost. Um, so all of these things, once you break down where you want to be, what type of school you want to be in, what size, outcomes, etc., that is where you're going to narrow your list to what U.S. universities are going to work best for you. So the first thing, um, so you're looking at the entire US and it is um, very overwhelming in my opinion, especially I know when I was going through my undergraduate process, if you can go anywhere, it's very hard to choose exactly where you want to be. But a few things to consider and um, to break it down uh, when you're looking at the United States is, let's first look at geographic location. Um, do you want to be in a big city? Do you want to be in a metropolitan area? Do you want to be in a small town? So that first narrows it down to if you're looking at all the cities in the United States and all the different towns. Um, if you want to be in somewhere like LA or New York City or Boston, um, that is a you know, good start as compared to maybe some smaller towns with um, a lower population density in total, not just in students. Um, so again, all things to consider. Um, the next really important thing is climate. So I cannot stand being cold. I hate being cold. It is just not fun for me. Um, but I do live in Massachusetts. So um, things to consider is do you enjoy being really warm all the time? Do you enjoy, you know, do you want to see snow and go skiing? And are you comfortable in the cold? Are you looking for something a little bit more moderate? Um, so there is definitely more research to go into this on your end, but, you know, for the most part, if you're looking at the northeast region of the United States, so right here where my mouse is circling, that is going to experience all four seasons. So you will get winter, spring, summer, and fall. Um, so you'll get anywhere between and let me see if my conversions are correct, it's been a while, but you'll get anywhere from zero degrees Celsius all the way up to 28 to 30 degrees Celsius um, in the Northeast region of the United States. When you get lower, so right around here, North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, that's where you get really warm weather. Um, so 
it tends to be a little bit warmer, obviously down in South Texas, Louisiana, Florida, <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to be warm year round. Um, and then, um, so when you're looking at schools and considering what is the best option for you, it's important to know what you're gonna be comfortable in because that's what you're going to be walking to school and walking to class in. Um, the next thing to consider is culture. And a lot of this does play into whether you want to live in a big city or small town, but also thinking about things like food, thinking about things like music. You know, if you are somebody who really um, doesn't enjoy country music, then maybe the South is not the best place for you because they are all about country music. Or um, if you are really interested in a lot of different foods, then um, um, and trying a lot of different new things. A city is a really great place because you'll get a lot of diversity. Um, so these are all things to consider. And then also the cost of living. Um, so as in any place, if you're looking into a bigger city like New York City, Washington DC, Boston, um, LA, San Francisco, all of these places are going to have higher costs of living. It's going to cost you more to go out to eat. It's going to cost you more to go to the movies or go and off campus and find things to do. Whereas if you find um, a school that's in a smaller town um, that doesn't have as many people or population, the cost of living is going to be lower. Um, and you can Google really all of these stats for any state. You can Google cost of living, um, LA or cost of living Boston, cost of living Springfield, Massachusetts. And so when you're starting to look at this, um, when you're starting to look at the factors, you can compare and see what you're comfortable with financially. And then also safety as um, always, that is number one um, priority for universities across the US. And you can find different statistics on um, number of um, safety, um, looking at police reports and um, all that stuff. And that's something that once you get into a uh, university specifically, you can look at their uh, safety statistics as well. So like I mentioned before, um, this uh, Western New England, which is the university that I represent, we are in here, actually, let me go back. We are in Massachusetts. So we are in the Northeast region of the United States, which if you remember, that means that we get all four seasons. So um, this fall is where, this is what it would look like about two months into school. If you started in our fall session, you can see that the leaves are changing, um, that it's still pretty warm, no snow on the ground, people are walking to class, but they're in um, like a long sleeve and jeans, so it's a little bit cooler. Whereas about three to four months into school, this is what our campus will look like. So you can see about eight inches of snow on the ground. Um, obviously, we maintain our uh, campus so that our students are able to walk to campus still. Um, but, you know, it does get cold and you will see snow if you are um, in one of the northern states of the United States. Um, so if this is something that really excites you, then I absolutely say go for it. Um, try and ski and snowboard. Um, um, snow tubing, like all of this stuff is things that our students love and enjoy and um, one of the reasons why they chose the university. But if the thought of a foot of snow um, makes you really nervous or you already don't like being cold, then, you know, maybe a little bit farther south is a better place for you. Um, and again, um, just to mention, please feel free to drop any questions that you have in the chat box, and I'd be happy to answer those um, after the presentation. So the next thing to consider um, in our list for institutions is the type of institution that you are be going to be looking at. Um, so there's a couple different factors that go into the type of institution. The first is a private school versus a public school. Um, and then a two-year, uh, so a community college versus a four-year uh, school, 
religious affiliations and commuter versus resident. So a private school versus public school, this is most important um, when you get into the size of the university and also the funding that is available to the university. So for the size, public schools, um, schools like in Massachusetts, Westfield State, UMass, um, Worcester State, all of those schools that, you know, it's a dead giveaway that they have state in them or the name of the um, state in them, those are going to be publicly funded by the state. Um, this may mean more opportunity for scholarships um, or um, a lower tuition cost for you. It all depends. You would have to look into it per uh, university. Um, private schools, um, on average, tend to be a little bit smaller, and their scholarships and funding comes through the university directly. They are not funded by the state. Um, Two-year school is a community college, so at the end of your two years at a community college, you would receive an associate's degree, um, as opposed to a four-year institution where you would receive a bachelor's degree at the end. So depending on what your goals are and um, where you're looking to go, you can also um, go from a community college to a four-year institution and just have like about two years left over in a four-year institution if that is something that is interested uh, that you're interested in and you have a community college that you're really excited to go to that is um, obviously a really great next step western new england is a four-year institution but we do have a lot of students coming from a community college who have their associate's degree and just need an additional two years to get their bachelor's the next is religious affiliation. So if this is something that is important to you, if you are, um, if you are Catholic, um, there are many universities across the United States that have a specific religion that they follow. And this means that if you, part of your core curriculum could be taking courses in those specific religions. Um, so Western New England is not a uh, religiously uh, religious affiliated school, um, but if that is something that interests you and you are uh, passionate about, that is absolutely a possibility. Um, the next is commuter versus resident. So what this means is that our our students living on campus, which would be resident, or do they commute to campus? Um, so many schools, most schools, will say that you can commute if you live within a 50 mile radius, um, but for schools that are specifically designed for commuter students, that means that they won't have any on-campus housing and you would have to find your own if you did decide to go to a commuter school. Um, there are I don't want to generalize, but there are less commuter schools than residence schools. So um, it's just important to look into their housing website and housing policy and see um, what, is, um, um, what is their requirement for their students. The, oh, I got my first question, but we'll hold it off to the end. Thank you so much. So the next thing to consider is the size of the university. So like I mentioned before, state schools um, tend to be larger. Um, however, they are, um, there are still plenty of private schools that do have large numbers. So um, things that you wanna think about is number of students um, total, the student to faculty ratio, and uh, school environment. So what this means is that in the bottom left hand corner, you see a, um, a classroom that is a lecture hall and is filled with probably two to 300 students, I would guess in that picture. If this is something that you are perfectly comfortable with and you are excited about being in a large classroom with a lot of other students, then that's fantastic. You're going to want to go to a school that has you know, over 10,000 people going to it. If the thought of being um, in a room with, you know, 200 other people and not getting lost or getting lost in the uh, lecture hall and not getting that 
really close one-on-one -on -one connection with your professors, then maybe a smaller institution would be a better fit for you. So you can see um, breakout classrooms. So the next thing uh, to consider is the student to faculty ratio. Um, it goes back into the same thing if you're wanting that same one, if you're wanting a one on one connection with um, faculty members in the classroom while they're lecturing. Um, it may be better for you to be in a smaller university that has less students per classroom. Um, the other thing to consider is the school environment. So are you looking for a school that is, you know, super um, uh, school spirited and going to football games and having a lot of um, on campus events going on? Or are you more interested in going out and finding your own events? So a lot of universities will have a mix of um, these two environments, but, you know, starting to get to know yourself and knowing what is going to work best for you. Um, and I do want to clarify really quickly. So just because you do have a lecture hall um, full of 300 students, I want to say 99% of faculty members in universities are required to hold office hours, which means that once a week you can go in and speak to your faculty member and there will often be breakout classes for your lecture hall um, that does break it down into smaller classrooms. So if you think that you're still looking for a bigger university, but the ability to talk to your faculty members, it is possible. Um, but in the classroom, in if you're one of 300 students, the likelihood of getting that connection right in the classroom right there is relative is lower than if you were to go to a smaller institution. So the next and very important part of all of this is academics. So um, all of you, I can't wait to hear and learn more about what you're interested in and what you're interested in studying. Um, but there are a couple different levels to academics. Um, first and arguably one of the most important is academic field of study. Does the university, do the universities that you're looking at have the academic program that you are interested in. So um, we have a lot of students who are interested in, or I speak to a lot of students who say, you know, do you have a nursing program? Well, Western New England, we do have health sciences, um, which, you know, kind of follows a pre-med track. However, nursing is very specific. So I always tell them to go down the road to our friend Elms College because they have a really great fan, um, a really great nursing program. So if a student says, you know what, I am so excited about, um, I'm trying to think, we do have a lot of programs, but let's say I am so excited, I want to major in um, Mandarin and Chinese culture. Well, Western New England doesn't have that as an academic program, so um, it is not hurting our feelings that Western New England might be might not be the place for you because we want this to be about your experience and what um, is going to be best for you. So um, it's first and foremost about having the academic program that you're interested in. Um, but the next thing to talk about is uh, academic support. Um, so what services are provided for uh, the students on campus? Is there free tutoring? Is there a career center? Um, you know, how is their resume building office? And um, can you go to somebody to help prep for a job interview? Things like that. The next is um, if you do need um, a proof of English proficiency or an English benchmark, then um, are you looking to get it at an ESL school? Western New England does not have an ESL school directly through the university. We do have partner programs that um, some um, some of our students do take advantage of, but through the university directly, not all institutions have an e uh, ESL school. The next, um, if this is something that is important to you and you're thinking about going into your future and what you're looking to get out of your institution, what are the academic standards and prestige? What are some rankings, accreditations? Um, so some degrees, um, you'll find that many schools are accredited in the same thing. ABET is an engineering 
um, accreditation that many universities have. AACSB um, is a business accreditation. So start looking into um, what accreditations do a lot of universities have and um, for your degrees particularly, is it important to have these accreditations? And then also looking at the admission rate. So do they have a higher admission rate or are they more selective? And also where do you fall in that academic uh, spectrum of, all right, I would be comfortable going to a school that has a 40 to 60% acceptance rate. Or are you looking to have a, um, you know, your top school, um, some mid-range school and then a few safety schools and looking at how that falls into your academic plan. So the next thing to think about is outcomes. Um, what are you going to get out of this degree and is it going to propel you into the future? Um, so job placement is something that as an admissions counselor I get a lot of questions about. Um, and just as a clarifying question, unless you are going to a school that has a program specifically for co-ops or um, that is specifically designed around internships, um, job placement is not really a thing in the United States. Um, universities don't typically place students in a job. The students will have to apply and make those connections. However, a lot of universities will do their best to open up opportunities for the students. So we have a job fair twice a year where companies can come onto campus and interview with our students, but it's not a just direct place. You do have to, um, um, you do have to interview for it and submit applications and all of that. The thing that I like to talk about instead of job placement is employment rate. How many of this university's graduates are employed after graduation within a year? Um, so we are extremely lucky that our employment rate is around 92%, 92 to 95%. So that means within one year of graduating, our um, students, 92% of our students have a job, which is really great because that's the goal of, you know, going to school and learning more, getting to apply that knowledge to, um, uh, getting to apply that knowledge to the quote unquote real world. Excuse me for one second. Um, the next thing that you might want to look at is how many internships um, opportunities does the university have? Is an internship required for the major that you're interested in? Um, how many students on campus typically have internships? So again, um, job, um, a lot of times to make it easy to um, apply to jobs, having work experience is very important. So throughout your four years at school, if you can volunteer, if you can intern at places that are um, align with your major, it makes it a lot easier to apply to jobs. And that is not just for international students, that is domestic students as well. Um, the same with career centers. So like I mentioned before, what services do uh, the, does the university have in place for its uh, students? Um, will they sit down and do interview prep with you? Will they look at your resume and um, make changes and um, help you along in the job process. And then also, if you are interested in going into graduate school, what does that look like? Is there um, a combined degree program within the university? Do they have a partnership with a different university that makes it easy and um, uh, condenses the time that you would have to spend in school? Um, is there, are there discount rates for students if you went to a university for undergraduate? Is there a discount rate to go there for graduate school? All of these things are, um, um, may seem a little bit overwhelming as a 12th grade student who, you know, might not even know what they want to study in undergraduate, but if you do know, it's really good to think about these things. And if you think, well, maybe I might want to pursue a graduate graduate degree at some point, um, looking into things like this will only set you up for success in the future. And then also costs. So this is the last um, point that I believe students will have to consider when they're going to a U.S. institution. 
Um, so the first thing to um, I want to make very clear is that I can only speak for Western New England University and how our cost and scholarship system is set up. Cost and the scholarship system will vary per university in the United States. So I think there's over 5,000, if I'm getting that number correctly, over 5,000 universities in the United States. So um, saying to somebody, um, an admissions counselor like myself, well, you know, the school in North Dakota, their tuition is X number of dollars cheaper or more expensive than Western New England. You know, we can only speak for our university. So it is very particular, but in general, what you will have to consider for a university cost is tuition, room and board, and additional expenses, um, which is what cost was meant to be. So what you're going to look at is the tuition cost, which is usually the largest number um, in the equation. The next is um, room and board, so uh, your housing and residence and um, any meal plan that you have. And then additional costs will include health insurance, books, and then personal expenses that you might encounter while uh, going to an institution. Um, so if you're talking to a university, let's say in a setting like this or at a college fair, um, and they give you out a number of how much it costs to go to that university, make sure that you have a comprehensive idea that it's not just tuition that they're talking about. Some, you know, some admissions counselors will only say tuition, but room and board can account for tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so those things are very important to include when you're making um, a decision. Um, another thing, uh, another question that I get a lot from um, all students is, uh, is your program fully funded or can I get a 100% scholarship? So in general, there are very few schools in the United States that will give you a 100% fully funded undergraduate scholarship. Um, if you are looking at a university and they say, yes, we can give you a 100% scholarship, make sure that you understand that that may only cover 100% of tuition, which means that room and board will still be an additional, let's say $15,000 per year plus additional expenses. And then also there are other costs associated with going to college anywhere, um, particularly in the US. 100% um, scholarship doesn't mean that we will, that the university will pay for the ticket over, which could be a couple thousand dollars. It doesn't mean that they will pay for the clothes that you have to buy if you're going to a um, university that's in a state that you don't have the um, proper clothing for. Um, it doesn't always mean that they will pay for the books that you need. So. Um, it's important to know that 100% scholarships, one, they are very few and far between for undergraduate students, but then also um, there will almost always be a cost associated with coming to the United States for um, your undergraduate um, program. There are scholarship funds and what we call outside scholarships that you, are more than welcome to apply for to help offset the cost. Um, but again, nothing in my experience um, with domestic students, international students, transfer, any of that, nothing will be really 100% fully funded from start to stop. Um, so just things to consider when you're speaking to admissions counselors like myself, you can always say, you know, what is the all in cost? What is going to cost me in total? Um, this is for all US institutions, which is not a phrase that I get to say very often. Um, before issuing a, a form I-20, which is basically your quote unquote ticket to go get your F1 student visa, you, we need to see the following amount in financial documentation, which is um, the cost of tuition, 
plus room and board plus fees and then minus any scholarships that you have received through the university. And that is how much we have to see on a bank letter and affidavit of support for us to issue a form I-20. And this is just so that we know that if you get to the United States, you can financially support yourself because we don't want to issue you a form I-20 and for you to get here and then not be able to feed yourself or buy the books that you need. Um, so this is a safe, it really is a safety precaution for us to make sure that you are going to be okay once you get to the United States. All right. So the next thing that um, I get to talk about is how to apply to U.S. institutions. Um, again, this varies per university, but in general, um, you're going to look at uh, the online application. So does the school require a application specifically for their school? Um, are they on the common application, which means that you get to fill out one application and send it off to um, as many schools as you would like if the school is on um, the common app. And um, not that anything, I haven't seen a paper application in a very long time, but there may still be a school out there that does require a paper application. So again, considering all these things and whether the school is able to upload your documents electronically or if they need to be sent to the school. Um, the next is we will need um, transcripts. So looking at your high school or secondary school transcripts, if you've switched schools, um, most universities will require both transcripts. Um, and this is for evaluation of your GPA. And our GPA is out of 4.0. So admissions counselors like myself do a recalculation to convert it um, so that if I'm talking to a student in India versus one in Vietnam versus one in Italy, um, everyone is on the same playing field and we can evaluate them based on the 4.0 uh, transcript. The next is test scores. We have seen, um, especially with COVID going on, we have seen a lot of universities going test optional, which means that you don't have to send in your ACT or SAT score. Western New England went completely test optional for our students. Um, but for some universities, that might not be the case. They still may require SATs or ACTs. Excuse me. Um, the next is the essay, which I'll get a little bit into more detail about. And then also letters of recommendation. So for Western New England, you can really send a letter of recommendation from anybody. It could be a guidance counselor, a coach, a teacher, just basically anyone who is not related to you, but somebody who can speak to your leadership skills or you as a person, um, that is what we're looking for. Great, and I see a lot of questions, which is awesome. So what admissions counselors like myself are looking for when we're looking at a student's um, application to the university? So the first is intellectual ability. Are you going to thrive and are we setting you up for success if we are going to admit you to our university? This will take into consider academic performance. Um, so how you've done over your four years or three years at uh, high school or your secondary school. The next is test scores, again, if a school requires that, and then also English proficiency. So this is not only on an institution level that we wanna make sure you are able to um, understand and grasp the um, uh, materials that will be taught because um, I can't speak for all universities, but most universities are spoken, are taught in English. So want to make sure that we're setting you up for success, but also um, the visa officer, when you go to get your F1 visa, will have a conversation with you and they want to make sure that you're being set up for success. Um, so uh, most universities will require some sort of English proficiency for um, before issuing you an I-20. The next is extracurricular activities. What have you been involved in outside of school? Um, were you part of a sports team? Did you volunteer? Did you work at all? Um, all of these things only add other really good um, factors to your application. Um, so it makes it um, 
easier and we get to know you as admissions counselors more as a person and less of just your GPA. I want to know um, what jobs you have. I want to know that you were volunteering at your school. It just makes for a more well-rounded student. Um, next one. Like I mentioned before, we're getting back to the college essay. And I do believe that there is a session on uh, the college essay or you can find one of them. And every single site that you Google will say something different about what they should be requiring for a college essay. But in my experience with reading college essays, I want you to follow the directions which means if we say 250 words for a college essay and you give me a seven page paper that, you know, I want you, it may seem like, oh, I wrote a seven page paper. This is great. I went over and ab uh, above and beyond. Um, but from an admissions counselor standpoint, I'm saying, well, we asked for 250 words and they didn't follow that direction. So um, things like that follow the directions and uh, stay within the guidelines of the essay. The next is keep it brief. Again, I read hundreds of applications every single year. So um, getting to the point and making sure that I know who you are at the end of the essay is really easy, but um, sending a 10 page essay is just, it's not what any university is going to ask for, for your undergraduate degree. Um, make sure you proofread it and spell check. Just those little errors are, um, you know, what can make and break in some instances and at some universities. And then tell me something I don't know. Tell me about yourself. I want to get to know you as a student better. Um, be creative and make it interesting is all I can say. Um, I love reading the essays because I think it makes it more personal um, when I'm reading a bunch of applications and I feel like um, a lot of students will actually stick out in my mind and I'll remember you as you're emailing me and um, asking a bunch of different questions. I'll be like, oh, I remember what they wrote about in their college essay. So just make it interesting and be um, authentic. You know, don't write something because you think that's what I want to read. I want to read what you have to write, if that makes sense. So that is the end of my presentation for um, how to choose the best U.S. university. And you are more than welcome to contact me at any point. Um, I will drop my email in the chat box at the end of my presentation. Um, but again, my name is Emily. I'm the International Admissions Counselor. We do have a WhatsApp, um, but as well, if you want to get in touch with me directly, um, my email is right here. But again, I will um, drop that in the chat box at the end. Um, so the next thing that I want to share is a little bit about Western New England University. So I'm just going to switch my... Right. Before we start off that, uh, to the students, thank you for all the questions and uh, for uh, um, actively engaging uh, during this session. Uh, uh, as Miss Emily prepares to get her uh, presentation ready, let's give her that one moment, uh, one minute. Uh, but we have a poll that we would li like to launch for all of you out there. And I hope, uh, Emily, can you see the poll as well on your screen? I can, yes. Okay. So have you heard of Western New England? Yes, that's correct. So have you heard of Western New England University? Uh, if you could please answer this question, that will be really helpful. Um, students are really helpful if you can please ha help answer this question. So, thank you so much. And I'm gonna wait for another uh, quick um, few seconds because it seems that there seems to be some technical error uh, for our poll, but I think I'm gonna wait for another 10 seconds. And um, so we have the results here and about half of them have said yes and half of them have said no. Um, can you see the results on your screen, Emily? I'm, I'm trying to- I cannot, up. no. Okay, um, I don't know why I'm not able to, but I'll try to share this, uh, uh, result with you towards the end of the session. I'm sorry, I, I'm oh. technical, but anyways, I'll, I'll let you continue the session and uh, take it over. Um, you know, Fantastic. Off. 
Well, for those of you who have heard of Western New England, um, thank you for sticking around and hearing a little bit more about it. And then for those of you who have not heard of Western New England, um, welcome. And um, like I can see that we have about nine questions in the chat box, but again, if anything comes up specifically about Western New England or the presentation that I just did, I am more than happy to answer your questions. That is my job. That is what I'm here for. So this is a picture that I actually used in the previous presentation. So um, again, this is uh, in the fall. So right around when you come, about a month to a month and a half of when you come to a university, this is our uh, green. Many students will, um, it's really easy to walk our campus. So moving from one end of campus to the other, it's only about a 10 to 15 minute walk, depending on how fast of a walker you are. Um, and then we'll get a little bit into it. Let's see. All right. So this is a video that's actually on our website. I'm not going to play it because I have not had really good luck in the past playing this on a Zoom call, but it goes through campus and you can see um, here we have the new School of Pharmacy. Um, my building where I work is not pictured. We're right around here, but it is a very walkable campus. Um, you get very green and we are located in a smaller town or, you know, Western New England really is its own bubble. So um, so like I mentioned, I am in Springfield, Massachusetts. So if you think back to the last presentation with the map of the United States, we're in the top right corner in Massachusetts right here. Um, we're located in Springfield, Massachusetts. We are an hour and a half outside of Boston. So I go there all the time. A lot of my friends live out there. Um, it's a great city. Springfield is actually the, sec uh, the third largest city in Massachusetts. Um, we're about a hour from, or about 30 minutes from Hartford, Connecticut, which is a place where a lot of businesses, um, a lot of big companies have jobs. And then we're about two and a half hours driving to New York City. Um, so one thing that I like to mention to international students is that if you're coming to the United States and there are particular things that you want to see, um, it's good to consider where your school is located in relation to an airport, where it's, um, where is it in relation to the rest of the United States that you want to see. So I love being in the Northeast for that exact reason, because we have an airport in Hartford, Connecticut. We have airport, uh, an airport in Boston, and then two airports in New York City. So um, the ability for me to fly to really anywhere in the US is very easy. Um, and yeah, so um, the next thing to uh, wanted to go over was we are a private university. Um, we became a university in 2011. Before that, we were Western New England College. Um, now we are Western New England University. And how that has um, shifted our goals as an institution is that we are more uh, internationally focused now. So um, we get to, we have a lot more of a broader stage for international students like yourself, um, which has, I love um, as part of my job. So um, a good distinction to make there. And then again, like I mentioned in the previous presentation, our temperature ranges is about negative five degrees Celsius in the winter um, to 30 degrees in the summer. So if you have never experienced snow, you definitely will. And if you get to the Northeast region of the United States, I think that's when it's best to buy a you know big old coat. Like I have a parka, you wear hats, gloves, mittens, um, snow boots, like this is all all stuff that um, our students have on call because you know we do experience it every year. Um, a little bit more about our campus. We have 215 acres total. Um, we are located in the subur suburban residential area. So um, Springfield and 16 acres is a neighborhood inside of the city of Springfield. So like I mentioned, we still have a city aspect to our university, but the university itself is um, more suburban and residential. 
We have 3,700 3, students total, um, so tw uh, 2,500 undergraduate students and about 1,200 graduate level students. And they come from 27 states in the United States and 30 different countries. Um, so this is, we are a smaller um, institution, so our, your class sizes are looking at about 12 to 1. Um, or 15 to 1. So um, on this slide, you can see that our student to teacher ratio is about 15 to 1. So that means when you go to class, there will be on average about 15 students per one professor. Um, for intro level courses, like your freshman and maybe into your sophomore year, your first and second year, um, there may be more instant or there may be more um, classes because it is more of a general class, but as you get further into your major, the class sizes do shrink. According to US News and World Report, we are ranked in one of the top tier uh, universities in the region. Um, our, under, our undergraduate engineering school is in uh, the top 100 by US News and World Report. And then um, our high accreditations that we hold, AACSB is an accreditation that only 5% of universities hold internationally. And ABET is our engineering uh, accreditation that um, you see is a lot more common amongst universities. Um, we are also the number one school in Massachusetts for getting a job after uh, a num number one university in Massachusetts for getting a job after graduation. And that makes us number five in the nation, which is really great. And again, going back to employment rate. So um, the undergraduate and graduate degree programs all fall into uh, these six, uh, five schools. So we have the College of Business, our College of Engineering, a College of Arts and Sciences, a College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, and then a School of Law. Um, so this building right here is our College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. It's one of our newer buildings and it is absolutely gorgeous on the inside. So specific things about our undergraduate um, degree programs, um, like I mentioned, our small class sizes make a really individualized in, um, experience for our students. You get to work with your professors one-on-one -on -one and they really get to know you. You're not just a number or name on a paper. They know you as a person and what your goals are and what you're interested in doing post-graduation. Um, we emphasize real world experience. We have over a thousand internship opportunities in the area. So in the New England region, we have partnerships and um, relationships with intern um, and companies in the area. We have a very elaborate first year program, which means that we have academic advisors um, and faculty advisors and peer advisors set up for you so that you know, this transition to not only university, but a US university can go as seamlessly as possible. Um, and then there are also interdisciplinary opportunities. So looking at working with your faculty members on research, um, doing extracurricular activities to really round out your experience here at Western New England. These are all things that um, we offer and are proud to offer for our undergraduate students. The next is our graduate uh, distinctive feature. So I'll go over these very quickly. I understand that we are working with students who are going right now into undergraduate, but if you are at all interested in pursuing a combined degree program, um, which means you do a fast-tracked uh, graduate degree. There are four entry points for us, uh, September, January, April, and July, so winter, spring, summer, and fall. Um, most of our grad programs will be completed within 15 to 18 months. Um, we do have both online and traditional classroom learning. So if you would like to do your undergraduate degree program here um, and then go back home for um, your online graduate degree, that is possible. If you want to stay, that is also possible. And then there's also interactions with working professionals because most of our professors are either still working in the field or have worked in the field for a really long time. So setting you up for success and job employment, these professors are there to work with you and um, try to give you as many opportunities to be in the workforce and gain experience as possible. 
So the next, this is Spirit. He's our mascot. We are the Golden Bears. Um, so we have 11 different residence facilities. All of our residence halls are guaranteed for all four years. So you can stay on campus all four years and we can guarantee that. 80% of undergraduate students do live on campus. Um, the other 20% are commuters. So they live in the area and then they commute to campus. And we do have housing available for our graduate students. On campus, you want to know what is going on. How can I have fun and enjoy my experience in the US outside of the classroom? Well, we do have over 60 clubs and organizations. New ones are getting added each year, um, as well as um, 19, and I believe it's now 20 with women's ice hockey, 20 men's and, men and women's varsity sports. So we are uh, NCAA division three um, out of the three divisions. Um, how to, and I'm just going a little bit quicker because I'm uh, aware of the time, but um, how to apply to Western New England for undergraduate is you can go to wne.edu slash apply. Um, if you email me, then I am more than happy to send you an application fee waiver, which means that you don't have to pay the $40 that it usually costs. We do have rolling admissions, which means that you send in all your documents and we can get you a decision anywhere between two and five days um, for undergraduate students. And we do not require external credential evaluations. So that means that we don't require WES um, or any other credential. As long as the transcript that you send us is in English, then we're able to use it. Um, you will have to send in your official transcript um, if you do decide to enroll, but at the time we are good with, um, we are okay with having a scanned copy. So required materials, I'm just gonna go over the undergraduate side. Um, we are looking for an online application. We are on the Common App, so if that's easier for you, you're more than welcome to use that. The next is, um, your official um, secondary school transcripts. We look for about a 2.5 out of a 4.0 scale as our minimum. We do need proof of English proficiency, um, a personal statement, SATs and ACTs are optional. That personal statement is the essay that I was talking about earlier. And then financials will be after you have already been admitted. Um, so affidavit of support and a bank letter. So the next thing, um, like I mentioned, the tuition for Western New England for um, arts and sciences and business is $37,992. Um, the reason why engineering is a little bit more is because you do have lab fees associated with the degree. Um, our room and board runs about $14,000 per year and other expenses like health insurance, books, and personal expenses are about $4,500. Um, we do have a merit scholarship that is um, you automatically qualify for upon admission. And this year that ranges between $10,000 and $22,000 per year. And the way that we determine that is um, if you do send in SAT or ACT scores, We'll take it as 50% of your SAT or ACT scores, 50% of your GPA, and that will give us the merit scholarship that we're able to provide. If you do not want to send in SAT or ACT scores, that's no problem. We will just send you in, um, we will just base your merit scholarship on your GPA. So this is a virtual tour that we offer. Um, so for our international students, it's very helpful because you can go and experience campus even if you can't come and visit. So if uh, Western New England you think might be the place that you want to come to, um, then you are more than welcome to take these virtual tours and ask our student ambassadors um, you know, about their experience. And um, as before, uh, this is my contact information um, and I will drop my email in the chat box. So I am going to answer some of the questions that we have had. Um, and I'm just gonna read these off starting at the beginning. All right, hold on. 
So how does a private versus public university differ in terms of learning and class sizes? Um, so I think I went over this a little bit, but public schools tend to be a little bit bigger. So you're going to have um, more students just because um, a lot of times financially that uh, there may be benefits for a student living in state to go to a state school. Um, our university is the same cost throughout. So that is why um, we have a smaller class size. In terms of learning, there are so many great um, public schools and there are fantastic private schools. So it is all about the institution specifically in terms of public versus private. You can get an excellent education at either. Um, the next question is, what are some differences between a college and a u university? A college will tend to have honestly more international students. They have more of a national and international presence. So if having a larger international population is important to you, then you might want to choose a school that is a university. However, in terms of the degree program that you are looking at, um, a college and a university mean the same thing. At the end of four years, you will still receive a bachelor's degree. A really good question. So I am interested in double majoring and wondering how it works in the US. Um, so this, again, a lot of these questions will vary per university. Some universities will allow you to double, double major, some, um, some will not, some will only allow you to minor or double minor, but you just have to work with, at Western New England, you just have to work with your faculty advisor um, and they will be able to um, work with you to make sure that you get all the classes. So in most universities, you will have what are called free classes um, that are more, you can take really anything that you want just to take it and maybe gain a new experience outside of your major. If you do decide to double major or minor or double minor, um, those free classes are more structured than if you were just doing one minor or one uh, major. All right. How do internship um, how do internships work at the undergraduate level? Does interning during the summer affect OPT? So as a OPT applies after you graduate, um, your CPT, you have to be on campus for at least one year, and then um, you would be able to intern. However, after that, um, you would have to wait until OPT to uh, qualify and if you were if you wanted to apply for stem OPT you would have to be in a program that qualifies as stem OPT so like for us it's our engineering school um, you would actually work with the international student coordinator um, who is a different office than the admissions on campus and um, for us her name is Zanab she's fantastic and she will work with you to make sure that you are staying within your F1 student visa guidelines um, and she will make sure that you are 100% qualified for CPT and OPT. But we do have international students all the time who are, um, who do, um, sorry, I'm losing my words, um, who do internships on and off campus. So it is possible. Um, in terms of campus life, uh, things to consider if you are passionate about sports or watching sports, um, what clubs and extracurricular activities are you looking for on and off of campus? Um, what do the residence halls look like? How many roommates will you have freshman year um, and throughout your university experience? Um, how involved is campus life? So this may seem very crazy, but if you're at a school that um, doesn't have as much school spirit just because they don't have as many competitive um, sports teams, that may be something that's very important to you. You may want people walking around in sweatshirts with your school's name on it, or um, you may want um, you may want, you know, it to be more normal to walk around in just regular clothes and not be as involved. So this is all things that are um, you should consider and what feels best for you. Um, do tuition costs usually remain across all majors? So for Western New England University, 
um, our engineering, so any program in our engineering school is all the same cost. Any program in our arts and science is all the same cost. Any program in our business is all the same cost. Um, however, this is just for Western New England University. Um, that's what I've experienced. You know, if you are choosing between biomedical and you decide to switch to um, mechanical engineering, your tuition is going to stay the same at Western New England University. These are all really great questions. Do financial bank documents for Form I-20 need to be supplied during the admission process or after admissions? So we require students to send in their financial documents after they have been accepted. So um, you can send them in ahead of time, but um, it won't be until after you've been accepted that we send you an email with the exact breakdown of how much you need to show. So it doesn't matter to us, um, again, this is per Western New England University, but we only require it after you are, have already been admitted. What are some of the questions that college, colleges ask for essay topics? Really good question. Um, so, you know, I have had, if I remember back to applying to my undergraduate degrees, um, it could be, um, you know, what is something in your life that you have overcome? Um, talk about an experience that changed you. Um, uh, oh gosh, I cannot even think of them right now. Um, is there a place that you call home that might not necessarily be your home? Um, so all of these will range between 250 and 500 words. So it all depends on um, the university, but if you apply through the common application, all of these questions um, will be the same. If I have low grades, but good as ACT, would that help me? Yes. So the way that we have admissions is a sliding scale. So if you have a lower GPA, but really high test scores, so all of a sudden you average out to higher, as opposed to just keeping the really low, uh, really low GPA and not submitting the ACTs, then all of a sudden you stay down here. Um, however, if you do have higher test scores, all of a sudden you average out to higher, which means more merit scholarship. These are all really great questions and I don't want to, I know I'm over time, um, but do we still have a few minutes to yes, finish this up? Yes, absolutely. Please okay. feel free to take your time. Uh, we understand these are some questions, so please feel free to take your time. No problem. Thank you. Great, great. Then awesome. Um, should we include in my essay what career opportunities I plan to pursue after my studies? Absolutely. That is a great um, idea for your essay because, again, we have had students send us poems. We have had students send us works of fiction. Um, we have had students do more of a biography setting. It's very open-ended on what the essay should be about. Um, however, we are, we just want to get to know you. So if you say, I'm going to come into your university and do a four year mechanical engineering plus a one year master's in mechanical engineering and then go and work on airplanes. Like, yes, I want to know about that. I want to know um, what you are um, looking to do and what your goals and aspirations are. That is a great idea. How much access will I have to faculty members as a bachelor degree student? So this is a really great question. Um, with our faculty members, they have office hours every, um, every week. And my, um, I apologize, my computer is about to die. So I'm just grabbing my um, charger. Um, so with our, uh, bachelor degree students, we have um, office hours every week. And then also, um, like I mentioned before, our class size is only 15 to one. So our faculty members um, are very accessible to our students. So um, we have students staying after class, emailing uh, professors, um, emailing professors during the um, during the day and our professors are extremely accessible to our students. So we have even had students, um, uh, you know, texting professors and just making sure that they understand assignments. So in short, very accessible. 
Um, but again, I can only speak to Western New England. Can you share some details on what type of jobs and internship opportunities can we expect as undergraduate students? Absolutely. So we do have on-campus jobs that are a little bit more administrative. Um, you could be working in an office, you could be a student ambassador, excuse me, or um, a tour guide. But then also if you're looking to go directly into your major, um, then we have students who work at an intern at PWC, which is a business uh, degree. Um, we've had students intern for the NFL. Um, Otis Technologies Lego is actually located right down the street. So we have, um, you know, like I mentioned before, a thousand internship partnerships and relationships um, in the area. So we have a job fair twice a year. So once in the fall and once in the spring and representatives from countries, uh, representatives from companies around the area will come and talk to students and talk to students about their internship programs and then we'll come back if they have set up a uh, job interview. So um, there are a lot of different opportunities and if you are looking to get a job at a particular company, our faculty members and our career center is uh, more than welcome or more than able and willing to help you get that job, inter uh, job interview. All right, this is more specific. Um, can you please tell me how I would go over, can you please um, go over how I can pursue a major in computer science and a minor in political science with the duration of the degree um, of four years stay the same? So in short, uh, yes. So like I mentioned before, if you are majoring in one degree and minoring in something else, it will basically mean that you just have to work with your faculty member to make sure that the classes that you have a little bit more flexibility in, you are taking towards your minor. Um, we have, you know, I would probably guess about 60% of our students major in something and minor in something else. Um, so it is all about working really closely with your faculty advisor and making sure that you're following the academic plan that they have for you. That way that you can graduate in the four years um, and stay within that time frame. If you do transfer or change majors, um, you know, partway through your degree, this may affect the length of time. Um, however, our faculty members, like I mentioned, work really, really hard to make sure that you will um, stay within the four year time limit, time frame. Um, so would the TOEFL be exempted as I am an IBDP student? We require, if you're an IB student, we require at least a five, I believe the minimum is, a five on an English exam. Um, that means that you know, if you get, if you choose to take the English test and get at least a five on it, then we will waive your English proficiency. Um, there are some exceptions to our students having English proficiency, but as a whole and as a generalization, we do require some sort of English proficiency. We do accept IELTS, we do accept TOEFL, Duolingo, ITEP, IBT, so all of these are listed on our website. Um, and we try to make it as accessible as possible for our students because, um, um, you know, we understand that you might not always have access to TOEFL or um, Duolingo. So we want to make sure that you're able to fulfill that English proficiency. Which would be preferred, IELTS, TOEFL, or Duolingo? It doesn't matter to us um, as long as you hit the minimum um, score for your English, then it doesn't matter. Our IELTS, um, the minimum score for undergraduate students is a six, TOEFL is a 79, and Duolingo, we require a 105. So many good questions. Can you provide the level of importance when reviewing for admissions, transcripts, test scores, English scores, essay letters of recommendation? For Western New England specifically, the top priority for us is transcripts. Um, and then if you do choose to send in test scores, then test scores as well. That is what we are going to base your um, GPA and academic standing on. Um, for English scores, we don't take that really into consideration for admission. Um, we do offer conditional admission, which means 
you can wait until you've been admitted to then send in your English scores. Um, that is just a requirement per the US government and for our university. So it's not so much as we're basing and evaluating you on your English score. As long as you hit the minimum benchmark, you're fine. Essays and letters of recommendation are for Western New England more important if you are a student who is on the edge of being able to be admitted because if you are a student who um, may have a on the border GPA, so may not get in, may get in, um, but then you have a fantastic essay and you have really glowing letters of recommendation, then we are more likely to admit you than if we were just seeing your transcripts and test scores. Would you be able to share more information on your Indian students? Yeah, so um, I would say that our Indian student population is probably the largest um, for our international student population. Um, many of our Indian students go into either, for undergraduate, they will either go into engineering, um, IT, or computer science. Those are the top three programs that I see, and that continues through our graduate program. We have, um, I would say, probably about 95% of students coming from India will be going into our engineering school. Um, but obviously, like, the entire school is your oyster, so you are more than welcome to um, go into any program. That is just typically where we see. We have a lot of students um, through my last year of recruiting. We have a lot of students coming from the Hyderabad area, but I also traveled in Mumbai, um, Pune, and Baroda. Um, and then my colleague also went back to India in the spring. Um, and she really traveled all over. She was in um, Bijudawada, um, Delhi, um, back in Mumbai. And um, so a lot of our students do come from Hyderabad um, if they are coming from India. Let's see. And one of our student workers, our student worker for international admissions um, is from India and he is absolutely the best. We, we love having Addy in the, in the office. Um, would it be possible for you to share some information on campus for the safety of female students and other safety measure, measures for COVID? Absolutely. So Western New England, um, in my opinion, is an extremely safe campus. We have um, our, um, our campus safety is available 24-7. Um, so that means that at any point you can dial 911 and you'll be connected to uh, the Western New England um, campus safety and they can be anywhere on campus within uh, two minutes. So a very quick response time because of our um, smaller size of a campus. Additionally, we do have a blue light system. So I know that, you know, as a female myself, walking places at night sometimes can be a little bit nerve wracking and overwhelming. Um, so we do have a blue light system, which means that there are a bunch of um, towers on campus that you can go to and press a button and an officer will come and escort you back to your dorm if you're just feeling uneasy about walking across campus back to your dorm. Um, another thing that we have in place is an app that you can download and you can set it for, let's say that you are walking across campus and you're like, I don't need a police escort right now. I don't need somebody to walk with me, but I want to have a safety precaution. So what you can do is say, I want somebody to check in with me. It's going to take me 10 minutes to walk back to my dorm. I'm going to set a timer for 10 minutes. And if I haven't checked in by the end of the 10 minutes, then a police officer will automatically be sent to your location. Um, so these are just a few of the safety measures that Western New England has taken for all of its students. Um, so anybody is welcome to use these services and because safety is our top concern for our students. Moving more into COVID, um, we did move to online learning on March 13th of this year. Um, we have, um, per Massachusetts and US state regulations, um, we have um, installed um, like new cleaning um, stations. So everywhere, you know, 
there are so many new hand sanitizers and wipes. Um, when we move back onto campus in the fall, um, we have actually reorganized our classrooms to maintain social distance. So we'll be working with that. Um, our professors, uh, our faculty, staff, and students will all be required to be tested for COVID. Um, if a student does become positive for COVID on campus, then um, they will be moved to a separate dorm and kept there for two weeks or until they are symptom free. Um, our classes will be uh, recorded, so any student that does need to be in the um, COVID dorm will have, um, will not be missing out on their academics. They will still be able to do that. And in addition, um, in addition, um, you know, our faculty, staff, and students are all going through training um, to make sure that we are all aware of um, what safety precautions need to be taken and how you should be interacting with other students. Um, we will be required to wear masks on campus um, per Massachusetts state regulations and also for our regulations. And all of our students, faculty, and staff will have to sign a waiver saying that I understand I am required as part of the community to be wearing a mask. And if you have any other questions on our website is um, wne.edu slash coronavirus. Um, there are daily updates for faculty, staff, students that you can go in and look at. So how does a housing and meal plan work for your university as freshmen? Are we required to stay on campus? Um, so for the requirement to stay on campus, we do require our students to stay on campus for the at least the first two years. After that, you are able to move off campus if you would like. Housing and meal plans, so this is pretty similar to any other university. For freshmen, there are four dorms that you can choose from um, and you rank them based on priority. And then um, you choose a meal plan separate from your housing. So let's say that you get into and you're in room 202 at Franklin Hall. You can choose um, any meal plan that you would like. You can say, I would like 21 meals a week, which is three meals a day, seven days a week. Um, for freshmen, we do require a minimum amount of uh, meals or swipes in our dining hall, just because we want to make sure that you are eating. You don't have a kitchen in your dorm, so we want to make sure that you are transitioning well and um, able to fuel your mind um, once you come to campus. But as you move and to uh, an upperclassman, you are able to um, you are able to lower the amount of meals that you would like per week. All right, um, are the scholarships renewable or only for first year? Can you share the minimum GPA requirements for a scholarship? So our scholarships are renewable. Our merit scholarship is renewable for four years. And then we also do have a couple other um, scholarships that students can apply for. Um, but this varies per university. Like I mentioned, some schools may only have one one-time scholarship. Um, so that is about talking to the admissions counselor and making sure that the scholarships are available for your four years. Um, and then the minimum GPA that we're looking for, there are a couple different factors as we do recalculations and looking at your SAT and ACT scores if you send them in. Um, I would say the bare minimum would be about a 2.4, 2.3, 2.4. Um, that is on our lower end and we would need to see a well-rounded student to make that exception. But for bare minimum, it would be about a 2.4, I would say. Popular clubs and activities and can students join the sports teams? So yes. Um, there are a lot of popular clubs and activities on campus. We have esports, we have rugby, we have um, craft clubs, we have theater clubs, um, music clubs. I mean, there's a list of 70 of them, so I could be here for another hour just listing off the clubs and activities. And then also what's something that I think is really great is that we also have community interests. So we have a club for, um, uh, which is 
you and me uh, our you and me club is a club that are, celebrates our diversity on campus we have an international student club um, so it's all about finding what is interesting to you um, and then can students join sports teams yep so we do have club sports as well as our division three sports you are more than welcome to go out for either of these um, the division three sports will be more competitive compared to our club sports and the club sports are a lot more relaxed um, so they may only practice once a week and have games on the weekends um, and it's just a little bit more relaxed if that's what you're looking for. If you are looking for more structure, um, then you can um, by all means reach out to the coaches and go out for the team. Um, they are more competitive though. So many of our students who are on the division three side of things will have uh, been competing for at least three, four years, depending on the sport. How does sport management major play along with the minor in communications? So what we have what's called um, uh, interdisciplinary major and minors. So that means that you can major in something, let's say in the business school, and then minor in something in our School of Arts and Sciences. That is no problem at all. Um, it's very similar to um, how I mentioned before, you just have to work with your faculty advisor. Many, you know, especially for the baseline courses, many of them will cross over. So by taking class to fulfill your major, you could also fulfill something for your minor. Um, but again, just work with your faculty advisor and be very clear and apparent with what you are looking to do with your degree. And then the last question I have here is you mentioned about bachelor's and master's combination programs. Which majors do you offer this? Um, so this is for our engineering school. We have a four plus one program, which means that you do your bachelor's degree in four years and your master's degree in one. Um, the next one that we have is for our school of business, um, which is a four plus one for our MBA. Um, so you do four years of your undergraduate degree and then one year uh, to complete your master's of business administration. Um, we also have a three plus three program with our law school. So you can really do any undergraduate program for three years and then you, you know, get to in your fourth year of undergraduate, you actually start taking the, school, uh, the courses at the law school. And so by the end of your four years, you only have two years left of law school as opposed to three. Um, our pharmacy program is a two plus four program. So uh, you do two years of undergraduate and then four years of your PharmD, which is a doctorate program. Um, so, you know, I could go on and adding all these years up um, by the end of it, but for, I would say if, you're unsure or you're just looking for more of a general degree, many of our students will go for the MBA program because you can go into any major, um, you can have any major as your undergraduate and still decide to go to your Master's of Business Administration, whereas something like engineering, you do have to have a background in engineering to then be eligible for our um, College of Engineering. All right, and our website has um, all of these Avail like our website has all of these listed as well. I think that was all of the questions. I think these are all the questions I'll be coming back on. And before we end for the day, uh, to the attendees, if you can please answer uh, the question on your screen right now is if you found this session useful. Um, can you see me, Emily? Am I able to? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, we're just going to be waiting for another 15 seconds uh, because I'm sure Ms. Emily has to go to other meetings. So we're just going to wait <laughs> for another 10 seconds. And um, we'd just like to thank Ms. Emily Smith uh, for taking this nine time to participate in the admissions one-on-one -on -one workshop series. I know it's very early in the morning, but uh, thank you so much uh, for participating. It was a pleasure uh, uh, having you here and uh, uh, we really appreciate your time. And I'm also going to share the results on your screen. So um, to Emily, can you see this this time? I can, I okay. can. Well, I'm so glad that you all found this so helpful. Um, that makes me feel so good. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. I think the information you shared was very useful on a topic, um, you know, that many students have been having 
in term, uh, terms of choosing an institution in the US and I'm, I'm sure the students enjoyed learning about your institution as well. Um, to all the attendees, the parents, the students, the guidance counselors, thank you for joining us. I know it's 7 p.m. in the evening, so we really appreciate your kind time and staying with us today. And also, uh, we'll be the Knowledge at KPT Admissions 101 workshop series is free and is fully recorded. So it will be shared with your school guidance counselors and as well as with other schools in the region. So feel free to check with your uh, school counselors uh, and also our social media pages once we post this online. Uh, for now, I think it's a wrap for today, but uh, please join me in saying thank you to Ms. Emily Smith and we sincerely uh, look forward to keeping in touch with you. And of course, wish you a wonderful day. Please take care and stay safe. Thank you so much. And I have dropped my email in the chat box if anyone um, wishes to reach out. Thank you again so much. And um, I really appreciate you guys taking an hour and a half out of your day to um, sit with me and speak about all this. And your questions were fantastic. So please send any other questions my way um, through email. I would love to hear from you. Great. Thank you so much, Emily. We wish you a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.